Welcome to Pocket Fiction by Steve Cook. Matroshka, Part 3 Layer upon layer fell away, the doll getting tinier with every halving. The layer of strontium turned out to be incredibly thin, feeling as though it could almost crumple in Leonard's hands. Beneath it, another metal layer, bluish-grey and then another and another. The doll shrank in his hands as the hours passed and the layers peeled away, metals becoming more dense as they plunged through the periodic table. An inch, a centimetre, mere millimetres. At some point, one of the crowd watching outside dragged in a microscope and hooked it up to the camera, and when it became too tiny to be opened, someone else brought in one of the micro-manipulator sets from the lab. The little screen attached to the tools flickered into life, and Leonard began again. Smaller still, the layers went. Leonard heard the discussions in the lab wax and wane, people drifting away. The picture on the screen of the micro-manipulator grew more and more grainy, as Leonard was forced to zoom in further, the Matroshka ever shrinking. The layer of gold broke the long cycle of grey metal, winking in the light, but it was too tiny to be of any value, barely even big enough to see, and Leonard set it aside without a second thought. The one inside was silver again, only a micrometre tall now. The door opened quietly, and Ross came in, closing it behind him. Leonard sat back, rolled his head until his neck clicked, then rubbed his face to try and dispel some of the tiredness he felt. All was quiet in the lab, and he looked at the clock on his desk. It's gone midnight, he said. We've been at this hours. Everyone else went home, Ross said. You should... we should go home. Margaret shrugged. I guess. She laid down the clipboard she'd been taking notes on, and tapped her fingers idly on the top of the boxy micro-manipulator. It's so irritating, though. I want to know what's inside it. Leonard grinned. That curiosity. It's why we're here. It's smaller than most cells in a human body now, you know. Smaller almost than we can work on with the tools we've got here. Completely impossible. Any smaller than this and we're into the realm of things that are the size of viruses. And then, single atoms. Her face fell. So that's it then. After this, we can't open any more layers. He shook his head. Maybe one more. We'd need something specialised after that, and it's so far out of our field. I just don't know. One more layer then, perhaps, and then done for the night. Leonard nodded, fingers already reaching for the controls. There was a moment of resistance from the sub-microscopic doll, and then the two halves popped apart. Leonard froze, the hairs on the back of his arms standing on end as he stared at the tiny image on the screen. Behind him, he heard Margaret gasp. The doll was empty. No more layers. No more elements. Nothing. Well, that's a bugger, Leonard said, letting his hands drop from the dial. All that build-up for nothing. Ross leaned closer. Turn it over. Maybe there's something on the inside of the shell. Leonard did so, and what he saw sent a ripple of excitement through him. There was something there. In the bottom half of the Matroshka doll's tiniest layer, something even tinier lay. Can the image get any bigger? Ross said, but Leonard was already shaking his head. They squinted, leaning closer to the flickering display. The inside of the doll was arranged almost like a room of a doll's house. Little tables and chairs, and tiny people, three of them. The image was in terrible resolution, almost impossible to see details, but it looked familiar. It's us, Margaret breathed. Look, there's your desk, and there's me. She looked up, her face pale, eyes wide. But that's impossible. Ross began to pace back and forth. What if they're looking at the inside of a Matroshka? And in that one is another tiny version of us. And another. And another. Leonard looked up, 
half expecting to see a colossal version of himself looking down. But there was only the ceiling above him, white paint flaking off in big curling chunks. But it's not quite the same, Margaret said. She had been watching the screen intently. Look, none of the little people are pacing, like Ross's. It's like they're frozen. No, they're moving, Leonard said, sitting back down. Look, one of the people just walked out of the room. They watched as the two people left flickered into life in the little room inside the Matroshka. One of them sat at the desk, the other moving slowly around. It's going backwards! Ross jabbed at the screen excitedly. I just came in, right? And on the screen, I just went out. And sure enough, as Leonard stared, it seemed as though the tiny figure that was probably Margaret was moving backwards, clipboard in hand. The movement was improbably fast, though. Minutes apparently zooming past inside the doll as seconds ticked by in reality. Imagine how much power is in that little thing, Ross said. We could run the world forever, solve the energy crisis forever. If only we knew how it worked. The little figures in the doll were moving faster now. Someone backed into the room, picked up the micro-manipulator apparatus, and carried it out in herky-jerky stop motion, a moment later returning to remove the microscope. Then the tiny Leonard got up and left the room, reappearing just seconds later. This is earlier today, Leonard said. I went outside to see what was going on. And now the tiny figure held something visible, a Matroshka doll. His hands were moving quicker than the eye could follow, reconstructing the layers. What happens when it finishes? Margaret whispered. But even as she said it, the little tableau froze. The tiny Leonard was sat at his desk, alone. No Margaret. No Ross. No Matroshka. A noise behind them, wood on metal, made Leonard turn, and he gaped at what he saw. The layers of the Matroshka doll that had been strewn around the room were floating, up into the air, one by one, drifting up from the tables and shelves and from the bed of the microscope. The largest one opened, hinging like a pair of jaws, and the next smallest, the painted layer, drifted gently into it before opening itself. One by one the layers swallowed each other, wood, plastic and metal alike, each one opening to admit the next. Like the rings of a tree, the interior of the Matroshka grew in complexity, until with one movement it snapped shut and hung there, somehow defying gravity. A wind began to blow in the room, slight at first, but growing in intensity until it was a gale that whipped their hair and plucked at their clothing, a tornado that snatched loose papers up from all over the room and whirled them around. All three scientists fell back to the edges of the room, and Leonard could only watch as the vortex centred on the floating Matroshka, which began to tumble end over end. Slowly, it moved towards the microscope to where, on the screen, Leonard could see the microcosm that had been in the centre of the doll. It's shrinking! Ross cried, voice almost lost in the wind. Leonard shielded his eyes as papers whizzed past, razor edges threatening to slash at him. Ross was right, he realised. As it tumbled, the Matroshka was shrinking, and the papers with it. The papers tunnelled down onto the microscope's viewing plate, measuring only nanometers as they went into the tableau and showered down behind the miniature Leonard. And then there was only the Matroshka spinning in the air, caught between this world and the one in the microscope. It shrank to hand size, cup size, to a thimble tumbling end over end as it disappeared from view. On the screen, the tiny man in the tiny room got up and looked at the paper that had suddenly appeared on his office floor and so didn't see the Matroshka that landed on his desk, rocked backwards for a moment, then came to rest. The scene in the tiniest layer of the Matroshka was hidden as the top half moved of its own volition, sealing its secrets away, and then the viewing plate was empty. The Matroshka was gone. There was silence in the office. Leonard looked from Margaret, who was slumped in the corner, her hair a tangled mess, to Ross, who had taken shelter under the table, Margaret struggled to her feet. What the bloody hell was that? And where has it gone? Back in time, maybe? Ross shook his head as he extracted himself from under the desk. It's a shame we haven't got it anymore. Our proof that we're not crazy just disappeared. I got the whole thing on video, but who'd believe us? 
Well, Leonard said, at least I know how it got here. And where all that paper came from. Then he frowned. But it doesn't answer the big question. He looked from one uncomprehending face to the other, a creeping fear beginning to rise in him as the full implication dawned on him. If we just sent it back in time, then this might be the second time we've done it. Or it might be the hundredth, or the thousandth, or the millionth. But if that's true, it's a paradox. Someone had to have made it the first time and sent it here. All we're doing is closing the loop. The lingering sense of having touched something unknowable, something far beyond human experience, filled the back of Leonard's mind. Margaret's whispered question broke the silence as she said what they were all thinking. But where did it come from in the first place? Pocket Fiction is always looking for submissions. If you've got a piece of fiction that you would like to hear on Pocket Fiction in 2016, then please get in touch through the website stevecookfiction.com. Thank you for listening to Pocket Fiction this year. I'd like to wish you a very peaceful holiday and a happy new year, and I'll see you in 2016. <laughs>